A major blow for the Harris campaign today after the Manhattan judge in Trump's hush money case delayed sentencing until after the election. Big news today is that the Manhattan DA witch hunt against uh, me has been postponed because everyone realizes that there was no case because I did nothing wrong. It's a witch hunt. It's a, an attack by my political opponents in Washington, D.C. and uh, comrade Kamala Harris. Harris was hoping for Trump to hit that legal pothole in October. And now, legally, Trump has a clear road ahead. Reality is setting in. And Obama world is telling Democrats not to get your hopes up. They say it's very possible that if the election were held today, Trump would win. That's what we've been telling you. Democrat numbers guru Nate Silver says, stop ignoring the elephant in the room. Quote, the Electoral College is starting to look like a challenge for Kamala. After a slew of what Silver calls mediocre polls for Harris, he's forecasting Trump winning every single battleground by one to four points. This is a massive victory for the Donald Trump campaign, and you know that Kamala's team is panicking right now. Judge Juan Mershon has decided to delay Donald Trump's sentencing until November 26th of this year, well after the 2024 presidential election. Judge Juan Mershon wrote in this decision that this is not a decision the court makes lightly, but it is the decision which, in this court's view, best advances the interest of justice. And guys, before we get started, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thank you for sharing these videos on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get going. Even though this judge is said to be very eager to lock up Donald Trump, they know that there will be legal limitations that will play into the situation. This is best represented by the text here that says, we are now at a place in time that is fraught with complexities, rendering the requirements of a sentencing hearing, should one be necessary, difficult to execute. They also cited that they don't want it to look as if they're interfering with the presidential election. <laughs> Wow, right? They're only now realizing that hitting Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee with case after case, is actually a bad look for our justice system. They're dumber than I thought they were, even though they had all the time in the world to do so before he announced his presidential run. But of course, since things are looking really bad for the Democratic Party, they're now siding with what's right. And speaking of the corruption that is literally happening every day in New York City right now, it's it's really scary. I mean, uh, and, and the even beyond scary part is that Kathy Hochul, the governor of New York, New York State, is allowing this to happen. And what they're doing underground, under the streets of New York City right now, is alarming. But what's more alarming than that is that this may actually start happening across the United States. Now, anyway, guys, uh, I'm going to leave a link for you guys. There's a lot that I post over on our other platform. Uh, down below in the description of this video. You'll see a link to our Patreon. If you want to check that out, you can. Uh, but get ready, guys, because this is rolling out. What's more is that it says here that the imposition of sentence will be adjourned to avoid any appearance, however unwarranted, that the proceeding has affected by or seeks to affect the approaching presidential election in which the defendant is a candidate. Now, again, guys, they're admitting all of this now as Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are inching toward their debate. Finally admitting it. And it's why some analysts are shocked by Judge Juan Mershon's decision. So here's Judge Jeannie Piro talking about it recently. What's your reaction to Judge Mershon moving it? You are? <laughs> I am stunned. Look, this is a judge who at every turn ruled against Donald Trump. Yeah. This is a judge who allowed prejudicial evidence to come in, evidence that had nothing to do with the underlying charge. And speaking of the underlying charge, most of it is expired pursuant to the statute of limitations, bootstrapped and resurrected by another crime that the jury didn't have to really identify. And and there's a lot of hearsay and there's some privileged information. Then in the interim is a Supreme Court decision that came out in July that said, hey, you know, you have to separate Im immunity or immunize and privileged testimony from the underlying uh, essence of the crimes in this case. And now all of a sudden, Judge Mershon is saying, well, I don't want to be political here. I think it's time that we took, you know, took note of the fact that we're in a presidential election season. Are you kidding me? This is a political decision made by a judge who said, you know what? This is a close election. I'm not going to give Donald Trump 
any kind of advantage here. That's my interpretation. Based upon a judge who did everything he could, even the verdict sheet in this case is not, you, don't, you can't understand it. I've never seen anything like it. And so now suddenly the DA, Martha, agrees. The DA says, we're not going to object to his sentencing. They want to throw him in jail, but they know that this is a case that will that will go in Trump's favor, and they don't want that to happen. Judge Jeannie Pirro makes a very good point here. It's either they don't want to add even more momentum to Donald Trump's run, or this judge is trying to get off the radar of Donald Trump, given how his own daughter has worked with top Democrats. So now they choose to acknowledge that Donald Trump is running for president. And it's like he predicted what was going to happen. Earlier this year, this is what the former president had to say about this case. Attorney General. Uh, the judge is obviously extremely friendly with the group, and we'll see uh, what happens. I think maybe he uh, may surprise people on a positive side. We'll have to see what happens exactly. And as we can now see, a lot of people are surprised. It's like an admission that there is a high chance that Donald Trump wins in November. Putting Trump in jail right now would only make the chances of that happening go even higher. He would also be hailed as the modern day Nelson Mandela. And by then, the people of this country would be made fully aware of the truth that all of the cases against Donald Trump have been politically motivated in an effort to discredit Donald Trump before November. The only issue for them is that most of the voters in our country are not stupid, which now leads me to yet another huge win for Donald Trump as RFK Jr. has now succeeded in removing his name from the ballots. Remember that Democrats initially wanted his name off the ballots, but the second he endorses Donald Trump, they want him to stay on. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has succeeded in having his name removed in two key swing states. Under existing rules, ballots will have to be reprinted before they can be distributed, leaving millions of already filled in absentee ballots in limbo. Former Supreme Court Justice Bob Orr says he disagrees with the Court of Appeals ruling, saying such a big change came too late in the game. I think what Kennedy and company don't see or don't care about is is the cost and 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 disruption. A disruption he says would hurt the military members, students, and others who rely on absentee ballots. And the cost for all 100 counties to reprint those ballots without RFK Jr.'s name, which could cost around a million dollars. It is pretty callous in expecting the taxpayers of this state to pay for that last second decision and to put this additional burden on election workers and delay the opportunity for people to get their absentee ballots. There's also the politics at play. Now that Kennedy has endorsed Trump and ended his campaign, he's specifically making a push in swing states like North Carolina to take his name off, to not be a spoiler in a close race. In states where it really doesn't matter, he's fine with staying on the ballot. But in states where he could potentially now do harm to Trump's chances, you know, now that he has made basically a detente with Donald Trump, you know, that that's where he's trying to to excise himself to remove that potential impact. Ironically, it was Democrats who initially fought to keep RFK Jr. off the ballot. Now it's Republicans in the Trump campaign who believe the state should honor his wishes. They should allow RFK Jr. to be on the ballot if he wants or to remove himself from the ballot if he wants, as long as he's doing it within the legal bounds, which he is trying to do. RFK's win adds to the snowballing momentum of Donald Trump leading up to November, which spells very bad weather for Kamala Harris and her campaign as they're now facing an extremely uphill battle, one that could be made even worse once she stands toe to toe against Donald Trump in a debate. Although some analysts are saying that all of this is enough to make Trump supporters complacent, that shouldn't be the case. They're reminding people that the key to victory is and will always be for people to go out and vote. And it is a remarkable situation in that you are uh, a uh, Democrat who debated her in a Democratic primary and now you are helping the Republican uh, nominee to debate her. A and on that, I remember in 2020, you attacked Harris for being too aggressive as a prosecutor, which is the opposite from what Donald Trump is saying about her as weak on crime. So which is it? What I pointed out in that debate stage in the 2020 campaign was her hypocrisy. It was how she was saying one thing and doing another, how she was prosecuting people for, for smoking marijuana and laughing about it when she was asked about it 
uh, on a radio show. And I think this goes to the heart of many of these different issues that we're seeing now that Kamala Harris is, is trying to hide from voters is how she says her position is one thing, but her actions and her record show exactly the opposite. And you can point to that on issues related uh, to the economy, issues related to freedom of speech. She says she stands for freedom of speech. And yet, as we've seen time and time again, her and Joe Biden have taken actions both directly and indirectly to censor free speech. Uh, most recently, I can point to my own experience of this, of how the Harris-Biden administration have added me to a secret domestic terror watch list the very day after uh, Kamala Harris was endorsed by Joe Biden. And I was on TV and warning the American people about what I saw as the dangers of a Kamala Harris presidency. Now, think about that for a second, guys. The minute she backs Donald Trump, she's then added to a secret domestic terror watch list. Remember that this is one of their own guys. Tulsi is a former Democrat, but much like what we've seen with Donald Trump, it's no secret that Biden and Harris's administration are more than willing to go after political opponents. A very dangerous precedent being set here, given that they want four more years in power. And I want you guys to listen to how Dana stumbles over her words after Tulsi reveals this to her. And right after, she tries to move the conversation to something that might hurt Donald Trump's presidential campaign. I, uh, I'm not familiar with the secret terror watch list. We're definitely going to follow up on that. Uh, but I do want to move on to what is happening with regard to controversy after the former president visited Ar Arlington National Cemetery this week. His campaign took photos and video uh, of him in Section 60, where veterans uh, of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are buried, used it in a campaign video. The Army also says that Trump staffers abruptly pushed aside a cemetery official who tried to enforce Arlington's rules prohibiting political activities. I know you were uh, with Trump at least earlier in that day, uh, at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Did you witness the altercation at Section 60? 60? Uh, I was there from the, the beginning with the laying of the wreaths with the family members, the Gold Star family members and, and some of the survivors of that terrorist attack uh, in that disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. I was with them at Section 60, and what I saw was a very grave and somber remembrance and honoring of those lives that were lost. And I saw President Trump spending time at the invitation of these Gold Star families with them. Uh, he was there for a few hours. I did not see or hear about any kind of altercation until something came out in the news uh, later on. The families were there uh, grieving alongside uh, President Trump and, and it was a very special moment to really remember their names, remember their memories, and understand the true cost of war and, and the consequences of the decisions that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden made in the execution of that withdrawal. Now, remember that Kamala Harris took pride in saying that she was the last person in the room when Joe made that decision in Afghanistan. She was even laughing when she was questioned about the 13 Americans that were killed in Abbeygate. How do you find any of that funny? And this footage um, has once again gone viral on X since Harris criticized Donald Trump's visit to Arlington National Cemetery. Now, I want you guys to note that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the current president and vice president of this country, but they couldn't take the time to meet with these families. So instead of focusing on Donald Trump actually being there, journalists like Dana Bash, they want us to be fixated on an alleged altercation with a cemetery official. It also shows how smart Tulsi Gabbard is because she knows what CNN's trying to do here. They're looking for a one-liner, a statement where she goes against Donald Trump. But she sticks to the issue, and the issue is that these people shouldn't be in the cemetery. They should be alive and well if only Harris and Biden didn't fumble their withdrawal from Afghanistan. And here's something that I really want to highlight with you guys from this interview. So Dana Bash has no clue regarding what she's talking about. I want you guys to look at her body language, and I want you guys to look where her eyes go every second she speaks. It got to a point where she was so lost that Tulsi Gabbard had to step in to correct her. And it is very clear that the uh, former president was invited in his personal capacity, as you said, by uh, a, a family of uh, one of the service members who was killed uh, about a, about two years ago 
during the withdrawal from Afghanistan. It the was question, three years ago. Three years ago. Three years Thank ago you. to Thank the you day on August 26th. Yes, three years ago. Now, when an interviewee corrects you as a journalist, it might be time to quit because your job is to come in with the facts, to know the details of these stories. And yet she's fumbling with these small details. It goes to show that they're intimidated by people who stick to the truth. And Tulsi Gabbard is showing that she is a game changer. By this point, Dana is just lost. She keeps looking at her notes and there's nothing there that can steer the conversation in a direction that she wants to go. And remember that these gold star families have come out to defend Donald Trump. They wanted him to be there and they wanted their photos and videos taken. Now, as far as we know, guys, both the president and vice president were invited, but they didn't show up. And to make matters even worse, Harris's campaign tried to call Trump out on X when she has never gotten in contact with these families. Facts that Tulsi Gabbard shared with Dana Bash, by the way, who also did not question Harris or Waltz like this. She didn't even ask that many follow-up questions during her interview with the vice president, but she's doing it to Tulsi Gabbard, which shows you the bias is clear and unmistakable, which kind of reminds me of the intent of Tulsi when she's siding with President Trump. Now, before this, Harris has basically avoided the media since ascending the Democratic ticket, and she's only rarely answered media questions while on the campaign trail and hasn't held a press conference since either. But finally, Harris finally sat down with CNN's Dana Bash for a pre-taped, edited, trimmed up interview that aired alongside her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. So guys, during this interview, she told Dana Bash that her values have not changed. Can she just boldly lie to the American people's faces any more abruptly like that? Now, this despite critics quoting her flip-flops on several notable issues, guys, which now brings me to how Harris's own colleagues are saying that her plans are flawed. Guys, I did a previous video where one of her surrogates calls out her economic policies. Now, this is a huge blow to her chances for November, so make sure you guys watch that video out right after this one. Click my channel, hit the videos tab, check that video out next. As always, appreciate you guys for being here and keeping yourselves informed. Thank you for liking the video and subscribing to the channel. I'll see you guys on the next one.